Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the session, Adapting Games for Family Play. I will introduce myself first. My name is Mireya Canto. I am the teacher of the visually impaired and I'm certified as a step technology specialist. And I'm a Hispanic female and I go by, I have brown hair, brown eyes, and I go by um, the pronouns she, her, and hers. I am with... <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marie uh, Russo Amro, um, and I'm a teacher of the visually impaired as well. I'm in the southeast portion of um, Massachusetts. Um, I am also a parent of two blind children um, who have Liebers. Um, they've had they they were born with some vision, and as they um, got older, and obviously it's a progressive and um, they lost their vision somewhere around, you know, middle school, sixth grade, seventh grade. Um, so I've been, I've, I'm doing this because I've been doing games and all kinds of activities with my kids since they were little. So it's just a thing I do. It's a hobby and I love it because now I still do it for my older daughter who has two children of her own. So in order for her to play with her kids, I still to this day adapt all of her games that I buy for them for Christmas. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, so that's who I am. Oh, let's see, I have light brown hair and um, I wear glasses and have brown eyes, I don't know. That's me. <laughs> yes, I forgot to say that um, I am an itinerant teacher here at Perkins and I work uh, mostly at schools in part of greater Boston I have been in this field for about 10 years and you know adapting materials is part of the job and it's really great to be able to share that with all of you and as we're going to talk a little bit about how visual impairment impacts play for the kids but I we also want for you guys to come here and explore and feel what we have here and if you have any ideas questions we'll talk about them at the end okay um, all right. So our first slide um, talks about. Uh, can I move? Yeah. Cause should be back to okay. <laughs> our first slide talks about playing games with a visual impairment. Children with visual impairments face numerous challenges when participating in mainstream games designed primarily for sighted peers. These challenges may include, first, limited access to visual information. Um, as you may know, a lot of the mainstream uh, games are very visual, a lot of visual cues, visual graphics, uh, I mean graphics, text, so it is difficult for them to interact with that information. The next one, uh, barriers to participation and engagement. And, you know, the fact that a lot of these games are so visual, the kids may feel frustrated, they may feel they're not able to interact with their peers. So it creates definitely a barrier in social skills and bonding with their peers, parents. The next one, social isolation and exclusion. You know, same, the fact that there are all these barriers, you know, being able to feel comfortable to interact with their peers, it definitely makes it harder um, to develop friendships and to even, um, you know, just have fun and play with the games. The next slide talks about importance of family play. So because of all these games being so visual, we want to make sure that, um, you know, as, as a family, you can start promoting that at home so they can have a safe space, a safe nurturing space for them to play. And some of the advantages of that first is the social and emotional development and it definitely helps create bonds and foster trust it creates belonging and it social skills like empathy cooperation communication skills which takes me to the next one which is language and communication skills like just talk about all the different terms and concepts that are um, described while you are talking about different games, like different shapes and the rules of the game. So it is very important for those um, 
concepts to be talked about during games. The next one, exploration and learning. And, you know, when you are with your family members and all the games, it allows you to have more hands-on experiences. For kids who are visually impaired, they need to have hands-on on everything that is going on in the game to really understand and to feel curious about what is going to happen next, what shape is this, what, uh, who's losing, who's winning. Uh, the next one, I'm going to go to the last one, which is promotion of independence and self-advocacy. And so when the kids feel that they are in a safe environment, they will start talking and to the parents, they can say, you know what, I don't like this. Can you make this bigger? They will start advocating for what they want. This is too soft, too hard, I don't feel this. And that's what we want. And we wanna create that environment at home so that when they get older, they can feel more comfortable at expressing those things too. And of course, because you're in family, within family, um, you know, you guys also can provide um, positive reinforcement, which will also encourage them to, to keep sharing what they're, um, what they're thinking or feeling about the different games. Um, adaptive, ga uh, adaptive learning opportunities. And this is why we're doing this presentation. And when you have the ability to adapt a game that meets your child's needs, it will definitely it will create, and Mary will talk more about that, gain confidence, they will be more independent at playing, it will be fun for everybody too. Um, by embracing the significance of family play and actively engaging in inclusive play experiences, families create nurturing environments where children who are visually impaired grow and flourish along their loved ones. And there is an image on this slide of a child who's looking at a light box with, uh, there are some beads on the light box and there is a, a parent right next to her and both are smiling. So that's, look at all that connection there. Love that. Our next slide is inclusive game design principles. Inclusive game, Design involves creating games that are accessible and enjoyable for everyone. The principles of inclusive game, of inclusive game design are, so as I mentioned, you guys have the opportunity to create your own games and that will be very helpful for your kids and to create more emotional and social bonding. But we have to consider this four different categories. First, accessibility, which is every game needs to be accessible and for all kids all um well at least for your kid different needs different ages it should be uh, flexible and to customize so depending on the needs and preferences multiple modes of interaction so once you come here and explore you'll see that uh, the kids could have different textures. There is some audio. Uh, there is some, maybe the kids want to use their augmentative um, communication devices to respond. So there are so many ways that they could interact with the game that is not necessarily by um, speaking. And the last one is universal design. We just want to make sure that it's clarity, that if you have to play it yourself without, with minimal vision, that you're also able to understand the rules and play the game. Um, all right, and our next slide. Okay, it's my turn. Um, okay, so this slide um, is, uh, accessible board games with large print, high contrast, audio-based games and digital games with screen reader capability. Um, accessible does not mean for people with disabilities. It's, it's basically saying just make it so that anyone can play. Um, as the next accessible does mean anyone can use it. Core mindset, who can't play this, why, and how do we fix it? So look at a game or any kind of an activity that you wanna do with your child and be like, okay, so how can we make this work for all involved? Whether there's, let's see, um, if you have um, two kids versus, you know, 
uh, one, that you want to make sure that all kids are able to play the game, um, whether they're visually impaired or not. So um, what I used to do is basically blindfold myself and then try to figure out what, what I needed to do to make it work for my kids. Um, so um, that's important. So, okay. so the next slide is how to make an accessible game. I have brought a ton of things that I use on a regular basis to um, make any game or any kind of an activity um, that I do with my children, even students that I work with. Um, I make it fun. I try to make it very tactual um, so that it's easy to um, identify. And um, I brought the majority. I have quite a few more at home, but I couldn't fit everything. I mean, it's a lot of stuff. Um, anyway, so we have a lot of things that I use, and we can, oops, I'm not supposed to move. Um, a lot of things that I use, I mean, I, <laughs> it's my little box of things. I have um, puffy paints and tactual pictures, um, all kinds of things that I literally go to the dollar store and I buy all kinds of things to use um, to make things accessible. Um, and yeah, those are fun. Um, those are little uh, farm animals, fruits, so that they can identify. I make little games out of different things that I do. Um, anyway, so let's touch on um, the different things that I have. So we use, um, I braille, um, I braille a lot of things because I've been brailing all my life most of the time. Um, so I have a lot of games that I have brailled out. I have games and activities that I've done that are just all tactual, like there's um, activity blocks, there's um, to do matching games. Now keep in mind, uh, these, especially the activity blocks like that, um, I use those for my students at school as well, and it's that are multi-disabled and um, it's a game for them to really just kind of feel the shapes, so it's kind of educational as well as a game. And um, you can, as a family, you can blindfold yourself so that you're all on the same page. You can blindfold the other kids if there's more than one and have it be a game um, to see who can match all the, game, all the shapes without having to be looking. Um, let's see, what else? Um, I also have a sensory box that I use. Um, that can be also a game to see who, you know, if everyone is blindfolded, you can try to feel around and find specific items in the sensory bin. I, I try to make those seasonal. That's my Halloween one I brought. I thought that was fun. <laughs> Everybody loves that one. <laughs> Kids love it. Um, all right, so let's see. Um, I have done years ago, back when my daughter was about three, I did a Candyland game. It's, it's pretty old. <laughs> um, she's now 37. Um, but that Candyland game is pretty old. There's only one person left on that whole board now, so only one person can play. But that it's, it's all, um, all different textures on it. They all kind of color coordinate with, um, with the pieces on it. Um, and the cards are all also brailled and have some type of tactual piece to it. And also the little uh, people that are on the candy, Candyland game also are textured and somehow I think there's a piece of braille on it or some kind of bumped out or something. Um, so yeah, so that you can come up and look at that later on. Um, so then um, I also have the clue game that I did years and years and years ago. Um, it, that's very tactile. It's got a lot of um, Velcro on it. And it has all the pieces are also have um, Braille on them and the um, Yep, there's, I use bump dots to have them feel the braille and write their, or mark their, um, their person that they kind of had a card of, like, okay. Um, let's see. 
also with the clue game, I don't, it's not in there. Um, but I also um, did an audio recording of the directions on how to play. Of course, once again, this was years and years ago, so it's actually on a tape cassette. I don't use those anymore, but um, well, it's a long time ago. Um, but that's another thing you can think about doing is kind of describing things for kids on, on some type of uh, format so that they have that. Um, but let's see. Um, oh, yep. Yeah, well, you can show them that. I, I put um, puffy paint on all of these little things. You can make a game out of that as well. I have letters and numbers, I believe, um, for that. And there are so many things. Oh, can you show them the dice? No, the electronic dice. Yep. So it's not on. You have to turn it on side. So this is pretty cool if they, um, a lot of kids are capable of like even moving their fingers to start um, to, to roll the dice or just start push a button to start a dice roll. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, I also use various dice, um, ones that you can put puffy paint on them or some type of a tactual piece so that they can um, use the dice themselves. And then there's ob obviously other dice that you can get that are already have some type of indentation on all of them. Um, let's see. Um, so the slide also talks about scented candles, Play-Doh, cinnamon, all of that stuff you can incorporate all different kinds of games with all of those, those pieces of um, objects that you can use. Um, let's see what, um, so we're talking about all the pieces to modify a game. I actually have um, Scrabble and Monopoly at home as well, um, which is quite fun. And I also have, um, I did a Sudoku game years ago. Um, so there's just, just endless things you can do. I also have a Monopoly Junior. Um, oh, and Trouble. Trouble is a really great game, um, easy to modify. Um, but I, I didn't bring that. I have. Um, I couldn't take all the games from my daughter, um, but um, we have that as well. And let's see. Um, so we can. Sh I can show you. I guess I can't show you all the different things. Um, just, just lift up different things that we use or I use sometimes for things at school when I'm working. I create games for my students, and I use various things like, you know, uh, numbers, letters. Uh, different uh, textured um, stickies and a smileys as well. So the stickies as well. So the blocus game, blocus, I don't know how they pronounce it. So that one at the end, um, I just did this this past Christmas. So the yellow and the red are modified because of the game structure. Um, the yellow, I believe, is the extra in the game. But those, uh, each of those, um, squares and different shapes of those um, all have some type of a uh, puffy paint on them so that my daughter can identify which blocks are hers. Um, and then the rest are not because I wanted her to know which ones she is responsible for. Um, so yeah, that, that took a, a long, long time. Um, a really long time. <laughs> but it's fun. Um, and then I also have Connect Four that I just, um, on, on the different colors, I only did one color and I just put puffy paint on the Connect Four um, uh, piece. So the yellow is, the yellow has the, oh yeah, it's on there already. So the yellow has the, the puffy paint and the red does not. So she can, I think, is it on the other side too? Yeah. Yeah. So that they can play. Um, yeah. And then obviously there is um, decks of cards. There's Unos. You can put Braille on them, or they come with Braille, actually. Um, I also have um, textured dominoes. Um, I don't know if you've seen those. These are quite old. I've had these forever. Um, and I don't even remember where I got these. <laughs> but those are great. 
um, because you can all, you can also do that not even just to play dominoes, but you can see if they can um, match the the um, texture on and make that a game. Um, so let's see. Okay. Um, once again, just like um, look at look at the game, see what it is that you need to make it accessible. I those are those are buttons. Um, color contrast, um, you know, do you need hot glue, bump dots, um, puffy paint, Velcro, wiki sticks, I use a lot of wiki sticks, um, pipe cleaners, um, textured paper, I don't have any pom poms with me, I don't believe, but we use on any of that. Now textured paper also, I've gone to just the dollar store and I don't know where it is, but um, it's okay. Um, I, I go to the dollar store and I just find random things that have different textures. I've gone to Michael's to get like uh, various fabrics um, that are, you know, extra. Um, and I just keep all that stuff. Yeah, I have a lot of stuff at my house. And um, I just like to use a lot of different things. Oh, here's the thing. But this I got at, um, this I got at a dollar store and every one has a different texture or some type of a different kind of design so um did that oh i'm sorry you got more um i use a lot of uh i learned paper yes and there's a lot of different kinds of textures in that that is available through like aph i believe but like i said you don't have to go through you know aph for any of this stuff you can find various things all through the dollar store and ocean state job lot and and all kinds of stuff um let's see um so i went over the sensory bin um so i i did bring my muffin pan <laughs> but um i was not able to uh have that i didn't have the time to create my little game um on the muffin in a muffin pan um you can have it so that you have a little um an object or some kind of a toy or something in each of the muffin bins, you can cover them all with some type of tissue and then you can see if they can match, find the matching object that goes that goes for the one that they, they picked the first time. Um, that's an interesting and kind of fun activity for all. Um, and then light up toys, obviously, we're probably very familiar with those and scented Play-Doh is a really, um, um, fun thing to use uh, messy but um silly putty i use more than play-doh now um, and now silly putty is all scented so um they also have the silly putty now where um there there's sweet smells and bad smells so it's kind of fun <laughs> yes um so you can try those out um ooh. okay um anyway so first of all Let's, let's, does anybody want me to show anything a little bit more clearer? Um, oh, the, sorry, the twister game, the twister. So th there's twister up here. So this one was purchased and it's all tactual, but um, you can actually take a regular twister game and modify it yourself and adapt it so that it's, um, um, you know, tactual and, um, for everyone to play and so that's fun and we also this one actually comes with um, a blindfold or blindfolds I believe um, so yeah does anybody have any questions or do you want to come up and see I was wondering if can you hit that I was wondering if you have any advice about maybe engaging the siblings or friends to use the tactile materials. Do they need encouragement or they, I don't know. I, I've i never had, yeah, I mean, I've, like I said, I've had kids. I mean, so I've always adapted all the activities that I've done with my kids. So when their friends came over, they just played it. Um, there were, um, course back in the day I don't know if they do show and tell anymore in schools but uh, she, my kids used to bring a game 
and um, the teachers at that time, you know, this was early elementary school, obviously, and they would be able to play, you know, when they had games time or whatever, they would have a braille game at the, or some type of adaptable game so that my, my kids could play as well in, in, in their classroom. Because a lot of times, especially early on, like kindergarten, um, even preschool, kindergarten, first grade, they, they all have like centers sometimes and they get to play, um, you know, games with each other. So I always made sure that there was something in the classroom that they had. Because I'm kind of a crazy mom. <laughs> that, that's great. Thank you. So, yeah. Uh, yes. Hi, I have more of a statement than a question, but I just want to comment on I love all the games that you did, but I also love that so many of them will incorporate positional and spatial concepts, things around orientation and mobility. You know, when you're playing Connect Four, you're talking go to the left, go to the right, go up. I love that that language can come out in these games. I just think that's wonderful. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the great presentation. My name is Maisa. I'm interested about your role as teachers in your role in the schools. How, if you have any advice or like throughout the years, how do you engage families? How's the relationship between the teacher, the school and family? And perhaps do you guys provide, uh, do you provide training for the families and encouraging them to do this at home? Like, you know, I work at Perkins and we work with programs in Latin America. So I'm just wondering how like, you know, this connection between how to engage families to like show them that this is possible or any advice you might have. Well, I think for one, we have this day um, but that, that is actually a very good question because, um, you know, a lot of the times when we're working in, the, in schools, we're not actually seeing the parents, you know, throughout, right? But um, I do try to keep in touch with my families. Um, I mean, the, I know that early intervention, they do a lot more of the, you know, hands-on at home because they're going to the homes and, and working with the families. Um, but I, parents ask me questions um i i'm i have no problem answering um emails from them and uh, you know if they're asking me how to do things i will just explain to them how to do stuff and how to modify things i often also um send pictures to my family's parents um or my students parents for that matter um because they will ask and so i just show them what i've done and then they either mimic it or you know sometimes if i'm able i have done like stuff at home and i've just given it to them because you know i just feel like i want them to be able to carry over what i'm doing at school and having them do it at home as well so do you um yeah i what i do too is once I develop some communication and connection with the parent, I, I do try to meet with them. I mean, every couple of months, um, I try not to overwhelm the parents, but I let them lead. Like if I see that they're interested in keep meeting with me, I try to do it too, because there's so much information that I just don't want to just give them a worksheet and look at it, read it, and I'll ask you questions. Like I would rather have a moment in which we can make some of this together. Like I'll bring some materials and give them some ideas so they can do it at home. And I also want to hear what the parents, um, what their questions are. Like I have a student who she's starting to learn Braille. She's in kindergarten and the parents are very interested in learning Braille. So there are so many, I will give them different programs, different websites that they will teach. Uh, braille visually and it's for free too so I just try to I do try to meet with them uh, I think it's a little bit easier at least for me I have two quick questions um, have you ever do you have any suggestions for puzzles and different um, levels of puzzles and also do you have any um, uh, resources you could share about websites that are including your own or social media pages where you have a lot of examples organized or other people, organizations that are doing the same thing just to get more ideas. So I'm sorry, I heard 
the first half and I didn't hear the second Sorry. half. Sorry, you can't hear me. So yes, yeah, so I heard about how you're adapting puzzles. And then if you have any uh, suggestions on websites or social media pages where um, there's more examples of um, how people have adapted games. I believe that um, as far as like social media, I think there's a, um, a, web, a, a group called Teachers of the Vision Impaired and a lot of times they put all kinds of things that they make on there. But as far as puzzles, that's a good question. Um, so I, if you're starting young, you know, I do, I, I didn't bring them, but I do have puzzles that I have adapted. Um, but they're like two piece puzzles, three piece puzzles. And um, I think the biggest one that I have is like 12. But what I did was, um, you know, I, out, I, I, so I get my husband involved and he had, um, over um, a, car, a piece of cardboard and then I took the puzzle and then I kind of like shaped shaped it in pencil and then I used puffy paint to make it make the outline a little bit bigger or like tactual so that they can actually you know place the puzzle I mean a lot of times the with the puffy paint it doesn't really you know stick together be, I mean the, the pieces don't go together be, exactly because it's you know, the puffy paint is kind of getting in the way, but the sole purpose is for them to actually be able to to do the puzzle, right? So that's the whole concept of it, is to complete it and be successful and be happy that they did it. So I, that's what I did for puzzles, because a lot of them are just puzzles. They're not in a any kind of a bin or box or whatever. So that's, that's what I did. Um, um, but obviously you're going bigger that probably isn't the solution but um, yeah so that's for puzzles anyway do you have anything um, thinking uh, so there is I wonder if you guys will have access to the slides because we added some resources there too uh, so American Printing House is um, which is where we as teachers we get a lot of our stuff uh, APH and there's a lot of textures, materials. There are some puzzles that are very simple. Um, they're made of, the materials are foam, and then the pieces have even like a little handle. And for some kids who like the light box, you can put them on the light box too. So those things are already made, but you can always, um, you know, find the puzzles that you can find a target that have like two different pieces try to find very basic shapes and just adding textures to it too because it i think it depends on the skills and the level of this of your of the child to see how 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 far how difficult how complex you want the puzzle to be maybe it's just putting the the piece on the puzzle together that's it so um yeah so you could yeah sorry back to your puzzles sorry um i would also sorry um i know that i was focusing on more of how to place the puzzle but obviously puzzles are pictures of some sort right so i would probably um the ones that i have i didn't do the outside um, but you can use puffy paint to do some type of an outline to you know of whatever it is the picture is on the puzzle so you can do that um the ones i have um did I don't know if I put puffy paint or maybe it was glue or oh no actually it was um, sticky wicks or wiki sticks I use that um, to outline whatever it was but like I said they're very simple puzzles but that's what I use stuff like that and I mean if if everybody's having more interest in where to find this kind of stuff I mean we added some resources but we can add some social media too because I know that's where everybody's getting their ideas uh, of some parents who are also posting a lot of the yeah, Pinterest they post a lot of like oh I did it with my student with my kid and it's very helpful when you see that more like in pictures yeah actually Pinterest is a great resource as far as like just adding you know just googling or not googling just uh, doing a search of um, adaptable games or just write visually impaired games on it and it'll come up with a slew of different types of things that parents have done and it's quite amazing to go back and look at that and and see what they've done to see if I've done anything that I should bump up and do better <laughs> any other questions 
there's one here. Do you want to? Hi, uh, mine's really quick. I just wondered if you've ever come across a game that you really struggled to adapt or what was oh, the funny. most challenging game oh. you came across? Uh, many. I have um, quite a few that are in my closet that are just sitting there because I, it's just too overwhelming. Um, but my, my oldest grandson wanted um, a ticket to ride. I don't know if anybody, right. Okay. So you're familiar with that. That's I opened it up because I don't, I wasn't familiar with the game and I bought it and then I opened it up. I'm like, oh my gosh, no. <laughs> Cause it was like, it's just, it, that would take me forever. Um, but um, yeah, that's still sitting in my, um, yeah. Uh, there's others I'm sure. Um, but so, but then I also look at like um, the, some of the games that I have um, like I said, I have Monopoly Junior, and and uh, there's other ones that I can't think of. I have a Harry Potter one, um, but I also look at look at the game and be like, okay, so what what do I need to do to modify or to make it adaptable for my daughter? I don't have to do it for everybody, but I can do it, you know, for her to be able to play. So I kind of, you know, um, I don't I don't adapt everything, um, and sometimes I don't even put now that her kids are older i don't put everything in braille because i let them read it um i know i have um i know there's apples to apples there but i also oh um cards against humanity was yeah <laughs> so but now you can buy it on 64 ounce 64 ounce games is anybody familiar with that so that's on that's on the, the slide as well, 64 ounce games. Um, so that's a website that you can, oh, there we are. Um, you can, I think you have to buy the game and then you buy the adaptable version that they have created and then you piece it all together when, once you get it. Um, the, the only issue that I have with that is that they're not, they're not cheap, it's an expensive, which is sad to me because why are they more expensive? But, um, but you do have to buy the game, I believe, or you did. I haven't gone there since I did. So apples to apples, I didn't, I didn't do that one. I think I bought that and then I had to piece it all together. But once again, there's a lot of cards there that you have to cut and stick sticky paper on. It's, it took me forever, <laughs> but, um, it, I think it would be easier to do it yourself versus spending all that kind of money to do that. But I mean, you can look at it. They have all kinds of games now. It's, it's a lot. Um, I haven't been on there. Have you to see? It is, it is a great resource. Definitely. You'll find some, I don't know, puzzles, but I know a lot of the stuff that you see here for sure. And I'm thinking right now of Etsy. If you guys are familiar with Etsy, they are also doing a lot of that stuff too, of adapting um, some games. Um, but yeah, 64 ounce. Um, is anybody familiar with Maxi Aids? Yeah, so Maxi Aids is another great little um, website. They have games, they have, this is where I usually get my bump dots. Um, familiar with bump dots, anybody? Yeah, well you can show, they're all up here. So when you guys come up here, you can kind of look at everything. I get all my bump dots from Ma Maxi Aids. Um, I also get, um, I don't know what else is here. I have a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so anyway, so Maxi Aids also has um, games that they um, have that you can get dice there. You can get um, all kinds of games, actually. I'm not, I can get, you can get like Uno, reg, regular deck of cards. Um, I think they even have, um, uh, games that have some type of sound as well. Um, so let's see, and then obviously there's Michaels and Ocean State and Dollar Tree to create all your, to adapt all your games that you might have at home. Some questions you said online.
Okay, so there's two questions from the chat online. So the first one is the digital dice, is there a name for that or where did you get it? Which, which dice was it? Sorry. The digital dice? I don't even know where I got that. Oh, this is an APH item. But I would, um, I would research. Like you might be able to find it on Amazon or something similar to it. It doesn't have to be an APH item. You can probably find something that can be um, useful as well. Okay. Um, if you go to the APH website and you type, um, or you just search for American Printing House shop, uh, this is Glow, Glow Dice. So that's the name of it. I don't remember how much it costs, but um, yes. <laughs> um, the second question um, is a little bit longer. So in today's climate where many children and youth are drawn to games, apps that are virtual or online, do you have advice on how to navigate situations and how to support students who are blind or visually impaired who have expressed interest in more visual game options similar to what they hear their peers enjoy? So I guess um, the, this depends on the age of the student. Um, you know, a lot of it, uh, I will incorporate audio in it. And I feel like if the parents get familiar with, um, you know, describing what is like the same thing, like uh, you were mentioning, like every game, you are describing everything. You are saying all the different steps and the same thing with the virtual games you have to describe the layout where is top where is the bottom what are the where's the purpose of the game and so right now so i'm saying what's the depending on the age of the student because you know ipads have now something called voiceover which i you know if you guys have an iphone you can go to accessibility explore uh, the option of voiceover and what it does it will read everything that is on the screen so when you tap on it it will describe but that is true that a lot of the apps they are not um accessible like even with voiceover it will not read what is uh on the screen and i think a lot of it too is uh, what we're talking about advocacy is uh, even reaching out to the app developers and be like this is an app that more students want to use my kid wants to use it it's not accessible i know it's an extra step but i feel like the more that we get to advocate for everybody that's how more games are going to be more accessible if we don't say anything it's not going to happen so uh, a lot of computer games to you know a lot of um Mac computers, Windows computers, they have also that screen, um, a screen reader uh, feature that will also narrate what is on the page. I know it could be a little complicated to navigate those things, but it is very worth it to start doing, start the kids with that so that they know that there are possibilities for them to interact with everything that is on the computer. Uh, I will say to reach out to the teacher or the TVI of, when, who this person was this person was asking um, to see if there are ways for um, you know learn how to use that with uh, some sort of a screen reader feature any other questions all right so why don't you guys come up and see come up you can stand up and all of you can come and touch feel everything that is um, Everything that we have put here for you. Uh, if you have any questions while you're here, please let us know. And please touch everything. Because <laughs> there is Braille. So there's some of the Braille items. It's hard to see if I show them to you from here. So, um, and we also have. So if you if you <laughs> if you guys want um, at the end there is a little container with there are this uh, pieces um, what are they with plastic I don't know what they are made of but you can create your own memory game there are six different pieces and we added um, three different oops, two different oh matches my shirt uh, three different um, textures. Uh, and we got some glittery 
so foam and felt and they're sticky so you guys can be like oh you know what i'm gonna draw a circle or a heart star square maybe shapes whatever you guys want and you just you don't even need glue stick it's already there for you guys so if you guys want to take whatever you want over there please feel free to do it and yeah please come in come in don't be afraid i promise it's gonna be fun for you guys to touch all this it's really cool For the people online too, if you guys want us to show something a little up close, um, if there is, uh, so we have, yeah, we have Twister, we can bring it closer to the camera. Um, we have uh, wiki sticks, we have um, dominoes, apples to apples, connect four. So yeah, please let us know if there's anything that you guys want to see. 